Hello, welcome to the Second Mix Podcast. Our guest today is Shayna Francesca, an interior designer and a life designer. She's full of helpful information for just about everyone. We cover a lot in this episode, but most importantly, we talk about getting crystal clear on the story you want your life to tell. Stick around. We start in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to the Second Mix Podcast, where we reflect, revise, and remix our lives. I love to talk about things that matter with people who care, and I'm here today with a dose of self-development to help make you better, stronger, and wiser. My name is Matt Bennett, and I'm bringing you some old-school personal development from the original Masters of Motivation, as well as interviews with entrepreneurs, authors, coaches, and consultants, anyone who has a mission of making things better. What is it that you do? I am an interior designer and a life designer. And people are always like, what is life design? And it's really about getting clear on the story that you want your life to tell. And then aligning your actions, choosing, understanding that every single choice we make needs to align with that, getting really intentional. And it's not about doing more because a lot of times people are like, I'm already doing so much. But when we get clear on the story we want our life to tell and we align our actions with our, that are intentional about our actions, really what we see, what I start to see happen is actually a falling away of that, which no longer belongs. So we actually clear space in our life and make room for the story, for the story we actually want our life to tell, as opposed to this kind of like neutral kind of just going through life that seems to happen for so many of us because we're bombarded by so much information throughout our day and throughout our life. Do you think that there are... I guess in most lives, there are going to be times where you just are in neutral and there are going to be times where you're not. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think each one of us, especially when we get overwhelmed, we go into neutral. We like, we go into like automated mode in our lives. You know what I mean? Yes. Yes. And then the other uh, really interesting thing that you've said is talking about clearing space and it's not about doing more. Can we get a little bit deeper into that? And what, do you have any examples? Yeah. So I, so for me, what I started to recognize is, especially as a woman, and I'm going to talk about this from my perspective, because obviously I've never been a man. So I don't really understand that perspective. So I recognize that this would be different for men, but for me, as a woman, we're taught, we're supposed to be polite and kind to everyone. And we're not supposed to lose friends. We're supposed to like, if we don't maintain friendships, if we part ways with a friendship, it's, we did something bad. It's wrong. We weren't kind enough or nice enough. It's how come you're not friends with that person anymore. And what I came to understand is that there are people who are meant to be part of our life for part of our story. And as we grow and change, friendships are meant to move and roll with us, right? So when we try to hold on to friendships and people in our life who no longer align with who we are now, it becomes like we're keeping these tangential relationships that start to weigh us down because we're trying to hold on to them because we feel obligated to hold on to them, but they're just not meant to be part of our life anymore. And it's okay to let them go. And so when we let them go, we make space to deepen relationships with who actually sees us for who we are now and can challenge us or perhaps help us to grow or just to experience who we are meant to be in this moment. We make more space when we let go of that, which no longer belongs to us. That's really good. Like bringing it into an actual method of doing something like that. If you're looking at your friends list and you're like, is it the guilt that you feel for not getting in touch with this person for a long time? And you have all these past friends, maybe that you're like, it's like a big weight on you because you feel like you're responsible to keep all of these relationships up. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) Okay. Okay. Good. Good to know. So you're saying it is okay to just let them go. Let some of those go. It doesn't mean you have to call them up and be like, we're not friends anymore. Right. It might be necessary in some relationships if they're toxic or they're people who are like energy vampiring off of us. Like they're people that come into our life, drop a bomb and then walk away. Those yes. relationships, it might be necessary to actively say, Hey, I need to put boundaries up in this relationship because it's taking from me. It's not giving me anything. And I am 
choosing to honor myself in this moment. And that's something that especially as women, we're not told we're allowed to take up space. We're not told that we're allowed to honor ourselves. We're supposed to sacrifice ourselves for the greater good. And when we do that, we slowly kill ourselves, like spiritually, emotionally, we start, we, we stop being able to actually take care of others if we do not take care of ourselves. And so Yeah, sometimes you might have to be like, hey, I don't want to be friends anymore. But in most cases, you can just let those friendships drift to the outer circle of your life and not not weigh yourself down with shame or guilt. Okay, so just let it go. Just Just let it go. Just let it it go. It's okay. Let it go. I love it. That is beautiful. When you are a life designer as your, I don't want to say career or job because I really don't like those words, but you're- What your impact, do. what you do, what does that look like? Do you coach? Do you speak publicly? Yeah, How do you? I, yeah, I speak publicly. I'm a writer and a speaker, and also also I'm an interior designer. So a lot of times these conversations come up when I work with people as interior designers. So that's where kind of the more coaching aspect comes in. Partnering with my clients to get like before I can design your home, I have to know who it is that you want to be. It's not about a, like making your house. I don't have a particular style, a design style. And that's because your home has nothing to do with it. So right. Why would I choose a style and impose that on my client? Because that would yeah. be simply, that would be simply, it would be coming from a place of ego and trying to force my will on other people's lives. Instead, I sit back and I get to know my clients and I, I understand their hopes and their dreams, what they want for their life now and what they want individually and together as a family or as a couple over the next couple of years. And it becomes this interesting exercise watching married couples actually express things out loud that perhaps they've never expressed out loud to one another. They'll express out loud while I'm there because I ask questions that perhaps they've never asked of one another and perhaps they've taken for granted. And so we're, we're diving into this. What is your collective story or your individual story and collective story look like moving forward? And then how do we create space that reflects each one of you? that is part of this couple or part of this family in a way that dovetails together and allows you to create your home as the stage from which you tell your co- the collective story of your life. That is one of the most unique things that I've ever heard on this <laughs> podcast in all of my interviews. That is, you are a interior designer and a life designer at the same time. Yes. That's not two separate jobs. And that is fantastic. I love that. I thought about being a coach. I don't think I'd really ever head down that path, but it is because in the interactions in my business and what I do, I end up coaching a lot of people and helping them, helping them with their lives and their path and their decisions and their goals. And so it did, it's it's like in conjunction. And I did have the thought, like, if these two could ever mash up, it would be perfect. But I don't really want to go around calling myself a coach because I don't call myself a coach because that's perfect. Yeah, because that's not really what I do. I think there's an aspect to what I do that's about connection. And really, I just embrace that. And I think the word coach is just so overused. And so many people call themselves a coach. And it's like, the word is just, I'm like, that's really not what I do, because I don't bring on clients typically just to, not at least at this moment, I mentor people and so on, but I haven't brought on anybody simply for the aspect of coaching. I usually connect people who really just want one-on-one coaching with executive coaches that I partner with who have the same belief system as I do. And they take that aspect on because everything else that I'm doing, taking on one client, that's hours and hours of time each week. That I don't have. So I really want to make sure they're best served. So we have these initial conversations and I have partnerships with psychologists and executive coaches that I can then refer people to if they want to sit down and just have about 90 minutes, an hour or something with a coach that has been doing it for 30 years, right? Or somebody who's a trained psychologist, who's, who there's somebody I work with who, Dr. Natalie, who teaches at Harvard Med School. And these are incredible human beings and they take that labor and they take that on for the short term or the long term. So yeah, I'm really just working in the home and in the media. And then I'm bringing in other experts to partner with me who share the same ideas, who can then support my clients in a way. So we work as a team, not just as like me pretending I know everything because I don't. <laughs> Excellent. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about for certain, I am a big believer in disciplines and affirmations and motivating things that you do every day. And in your bio, it said that you had a spiritual practice built into your daily life. 
Yeah. What does that look like? That looks like meditation. What I came to understand when I stepped away from Christianity is that the voice I had been hearing all these times when I was praying was actually my voice. (laughs) It was my inner knowing that was coming up and deep wisdom that was rooted in the foundation of who I am and that connects us all is what was coming up. And as I started diving into, it's now been two years of meditating on a daily basis to the point where now I meditate somewhere around 10 to 15 minutes a day, which is a lot when you, when I recognize that like just two years ago, I couldn't meditate for more than a minute without being like, this is weird. And I also have ADHD and complex PTSD and they're very much intertwined. Medicine and science is showing us that they happen in tandem when young people whose brains are not fully formed experience excessive amounts of trauma that creates PTSD. It inhibits your frontal, your brain growth and inhibits your frontal lobe and creates ADHD. At least that's where the hypothesis is at this moment. My, my body is in constant fight or flight mode, right? So all this goes back to why is it important for me to meditate? Because my body and my mind is in constant fight, fight, or flight mode. And when I can get quiet and I can get just, just take some intentional breaths, like actively just listen to my breath, go in and out of my body and recognize and just let myself know that I'm safe with me. In the past in Christianity, it told me that I should not trust myself. I should only trust this external puppet master in the sky. And I had no right to govern myself or to know myself that only God could truly know me. I came to recognize that none of that is true, that I do know me and I am safe with me and I can trust my intuition and I can trust my inner knowing and that I'm safe inside my own. And doing that has transformed so many aspects of my life that I was actually able to go off my ADHD medicine that I've been on since I was five. Wow. By working through my, by working through my PTSD. And part of that was reading books like The Body Keeps the Score. So I could understand my PTSD and my ADHD, understand the role that meditation and some other modalities have in remapping. So PTSD actually rewires your brain. It's stored, it's physically stored within your body. It's a body thing, not a mind thing. And that is a very important distinction. So for anybody who struggles with, has ADHD, who struggles with PTSD, I highly recommend the book. I also recommend that you get support while you read it, a therapist or something, because it by itself can be very triggering. It shows you what needs to heal inside of you. But going through that process has allowed me to see where I can remap my heart rate because your variable heart rate changes because of PTSD. There are so many physical changes. Wow. And once I was able to dive into that, I started, this is why I say everything is connected. Everything is connected. We compartmentalize things such that we have lost the recognition that everything is connected. And once we start leaning into that, it changes everything. So my spiritual practice is a, a consistent learning, a consistent meditation practice, consistently listening to myself and why does this keep coming up? Why does this keep happening? What's going on here? Can I dive in and understand the systems in place and dive into all different aspects of medicine, science, technology that helps me to see myself through a new lens and to be able to heal those things that allows me to then like, so it's a spiritual practice, but it's all encompassing. For me, a spiritual practice is not just spirit. It's physical, it's mental, it's emotional. It's all the things. I like walking, that. Walking is a huge part of my spiritual practice. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like that. That is part of mine too. I've got woods out back and I have a three quarter of a mile trail carved into the woods yep. and I'll go four or five miles some days. Just, I use half to listen to a book and then the other half just turn it off and just, it off. just walk. I'm with you. Yeah, absolutely. I just started reading the book, The Will to Change. It's about, it's about patriarchy, about masculinity. It's written by Bell Hook. And the entire book is about patriarchy and how it's fed and upheld by both men and women and in which way it manifests itself and how we can work together to end it. So I, I did the same thing. As I told you, my face was so red when we started because I just came in from 90 degree weather, but I spent the first half listening to a book. And then I spend the second half, either just listening to quiet meditation music or nothing at all and sometimes i'll pick flowers and sometimes i'll watch the bugs bugs are fascinating and just like my daughter would agree yeah bugs are fascinating (laughs) or i might like just hug a tree or stand there and touch a tree 
people think I'm crazy, I might reach out and give a tree a high five because trees also talk to one another. They're exceptionally wise beings. They talk to one another through mycelium. Anybody who's watched Fantastic Funk, trees are fascinating and they help one another and they're a community. And yeah, I absolutely talk to trees and watch bugs, <laughs> do all the things and helps me to recognize that we are all together. We're all in this together. And you consider that all a part of your spiritual practice that you have yes. built into your life. And I really like that. I have, I've came to the conclusion, like I've tried to meditate and yeah. I've asked for advice on meditation and I've really sat there for an hour and cleared my head. And the only thing that I could not get past once I, it was over, once I've hit the 20 minutes or the 30 or yeah. whatever, I was just like, I don't feel like it did anything for me. And I, but maybe it's because your expectation and I'm, I could be right or wrong. I'm not this saying is, I'm not this is good. Hey, I'll yeah. tell you this. I'll tell you this first before you have to yeah. answer any more questions for me. I love being coached. I love being coached on this show. I'm not embarrassed. Yeah. I'm not ashamed. So if you're going to tell <laughs> me either. that, if you're going to tell me that I'm doing something wrong, I've got no problem. It's that. not about right or wrong. I've gotten to the place where I recognize that things aren't right or wrong. Perhaps it's not. And I think when I struggle with the same thing, when I first started meditating, so I'm just coming from a place that perhaps you're viewing it the way that I viewed it. And it is that something miraculous was supposed to happen or that I was supposed to be able to clear my mind and not think of anything for certain periods of time. What I came to recognize is there's a so much simplicity in it. And I also read the book, Become Water, My Friend. It's by, what's his name's daughter? Shannon Lee. It's, she wrote it all about her, about her father. Okay. But it's also about his, about her and his practice, their spiritual practice. And I love how simple she made it. She just talks about the fact that it's just, it's so simple. And sometimes we make it complicated because people in the spiritual world, this is something that I've connected a lot of spiritual creators about is that spirituality in many aspects actually mirrors and is a template of Christianity, of evangelical Christianity, right? Talking about the divine masculine and divine feminine, and we must embrace our gender roles. It's a repackaging of patriarchy and of capitalism and of this really dog. It's just new language for the same old shit. And so we have to be really careful that we aren't viewing spirituality that way. Like it's not just repackaged Christianity and repackaged patriarchy. And so I think when we get really simple and really quiet and just recognize, think about water, it's peaceful and yet it's ever moving, right? Like the top may look calm, but underneath all this life is happening. And so that's like our mind, it, we may be sitting there. But that doesn't mean we stop being human and we stop being alive. And perhaps Pema Chodron said, the Buddhist nun, she said, when thoughts come up, you just label it thinking and you just let the thoughts come in and you let them go and you don't label them as good or bad and you don't label yourself as good or bad. You just let them come up and you let them go and you shelf them for whenever you're done. And just, I think the importance for me is just sitting still and being quiet and doing my best to remember to think about my breathing in and out, to be present to my breathing. And if I can, in the 15 minutes that I'm sitting there, spend like a full minute and a half, like actually just focused on my breathing. That's like flip an amazing accomplishment because 90% okay. of the time is spent <clears throat> being like, oh my gosh, another thought. Oh, okay. Let's let that thought go. And let's think about breathing again right? Sometimes a full three, four, five minutes will go by. And I've thought about a whole bunch of stuff for the last five minutes. And I'm like, oh, we're supposed to be meditating. <laughs> right? It's not about perfection. And it's not about right or wrong. It's just about being as intentional with those 15 minutes as we can. And just getting quiet with ourselves and just letting what happened happen and not judging it. If those 10 minutes go by and we've let them go by without judging ourselves, that's an accomplishment all by itself. Right? Okay. Like, yes. Not supposed to be some mystical experience. Could it be? Sure. Is it supposed to be? No. What it is, what you decide it is. And no one else has any say in that. No one. So I think sometimes it's the voice of judgment that comes in our head that makes meditation feel like it's not applicable for us, but it's typically because there's something that we're using externally to judge ourselves in that moment with. That's my two cents. Take it or okay. leave it. That's my two cents. I might actually read a little bit more about it and start attempting, or I don't like that word. I'll just start doing it again. 
Yeah. But uh, also walking, you can meditate while walking. Sometimes that's a better way to start is just by walking and turning off your music and looking at the trees and focusing on your breathing. Sometimes that's a good way to get into a meditation mm-hmm. practice. Nobody says you have to be sitting still for meditation. Anybody who does, anybody who tells you what you're supposed to do with your life and pretends like they know it all is full of shit. Just let me reassure you that. Hey man, I do like that. <laughs> I do like that. So there, there are a couple of things that I definitely want to get to before we close up. So you've talked about changing your physical surroundings mm. to when, in, when something terrible happens to you in, yes. in the light of any trauma that has hit you, yeah. change your physical surroundings helps. I want to hear about that. And the question that I'm going to ask you right after you talk about it is, is this thing like if something happens bad right now and I go out in the woods, that's changing my physical surroundings? Or are you talking about moving to a different state? No. So I think it could be any of those things. If something really shitty has happened, maybe sometimes the first thing you want to do is go run. Like for women, a lot of times we want to scrub a dish or fold laundry very angrily or go for a walk or we want, we want to do something physical. Anger manifests itself physically for us too. A lot of times men think that it doesn't for us, but it absolutely does. And we absolutely feel the need to punch something sometimes. So we angrily scrub a dish instead or go for a walk. Or my younger self did put a hole through the wall with my fist. And at 12, I realized I was going to have to keep punching these holes, uh, patching these holes. So it was probably better to find another way. But I think it's important to just take a minute and recognize, okay, this moment, what's surrounded, all this energy came out of me right? All this energy came on me and whoever I was interacting with. And we need to let that energy out of this room. We need to let it go. We need to move it around. We need to move ourselves around because we were literally all made of energy and energy enters the room when we do. And if we expel all that energy and start bashing each other with it, we've got to reset. And that could mean maybe straightening up the room or reorganizing the furniture. It could mean just going for a walk and changing your physical surroundings for that moment. It could mean opening up a window and letting some fresh air in so you can change the smell in the room. Smell is our strongest connection to memory and emotion. So if there's a particular smell, like, okay, for instance, when I say to people, think about your grandmother's house or your favorite aunt, there's an, Im- there's an immediate smell memory that comes up typically, right? It's like that. So we can recall specific emotions or we can call up or change the emotional space of a room with changing the scent of a room. So we might, after a big fight, we might light a candle, but the key is that the scent that we bring into the space now must be one that's already associated with joy and happiness. It's nearly impossible to overwrite a scent memory. That means if you associate clementines with being bullied and having them thrown at you as a kid at your head, you cannot use clementine in as a scent that brings you joy. It's going to be nearly impossible to change that scent memory. However, if lavender is something you associate with spa and relaxation, that might be something that you light in the room. Give it a minute, open the windows, let the scent of all that hormonal stuff that just got exchanged out, light a candle, change the scent of the room, resets the stage. It could mean moving. It could mean moving because perhaps you don't have control of the space you live in. Perhaps you're living with a partner who is very controlling and doesn't allow you to be reflected in that space. And you need to get away from them or a family member or a friend. Perhaps you need to reset that stage. Only you can decide what that looks like. But no matter what we do, we have to recognize that we can't run away from reality. But if we allow ourselves to move through it, sometimes changing that dynamic is necessary. Sometimes you need to get away from abusive family members and friends. And that's the way that you're going to be able to actually craft the story of your life. But I also recognize that there are economic and social limitations on many people's ability to actually get away from their current situation, which is why I say a really simple way to do that might be to get an inexpensive candle with a scent that you love and lock your bedroom door or your room door and light a candle and create that as a safe space for yourself. Cause that's wow. what I did. Kid. That's what I did. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's, that is great. And there are a couple of things. I think that's brilliant advice for people. You were talking about everything being connected and yeah. just, so if you're having a mental and spiritual bad energy, negative energy, it might has to have to be a, the physical that changes. Might. It's almost like if the physical is doing bad in your life, 
you need to change your mind. It's a reflection. Of, so our physical space is a reflection of our beliefs about ourselves. Now that doesn't mean that because your space is perfectly tidy and clean, that there isn't a lot of shit going on <laughs> because perfectionism can be, a, is a dis, it can be a dysfunctional. It is dysfunctional behavior, right? I don't want to say dysfunctional, but it is like dysfunctional thought process, right? Like it's us. Perfection doesn't exist. That's why it's a dysfunctional thought process. It doesn't exist. It is unachievable. So we're creating this unachievable thing for ourselves and trying to match our physical surrounding with it, which is in fact not healthy. Yeah. Our physical surroundings are a reflection of our beliefs about ourselves in a multitude of ways. And so when we are kind to ourselves, and kind about our physical surroundings. They might be clean and tidy, but not perfect. And then we can know that we're at peace with ourselves. And and also the way that we take up space also is a reflection. If we're constantly walking, like if there's a piece of furniture in our life that we're constantly having to walk around or we bump into, we've literally created that as a physical barrier, as if we aren't allowed to take up that space. And so then typically there's some kind of association with us not being allowed to take up space in the world that's also living in our brain. Not always. I'm not a psychologist either, but this is the reality that I've come to recognize in patterns of behavior in my clients of why do you keep that there and you keep walking into it and you've got like a permanent bruise? Why can't we move it? And then all these weird things start coming up, these justifications. And I'm like, oh, there it is. Right. (laughs) Okay. Okay. And and that's when I bring in the psychologist. (laughs) Fair enough. That's perfect. Wow. So yeah, I want to talk about the scent thing. It's really interesting. I don't know. This isn't anything that I connect with my past, but Mm. the soap, the foaming soaps that smell really good. Yeah. If I'm stressed out or whatever, I go wash my face in my hand. I wash my face. I wash my hands in there. And I actually just, just, just breathe it in from my hands. And I never thought about that as any kind of a spiritual practice or anything, but but, yep. it, it truly does calm me down yeah. and it, yeah. it gets me right where I need to go. In fact, one of the most, I've had a pretty easy life, but a really traumatic thing that happened to me recently, I got COVID and oh. I lost my smell and taste. Oh, because and, they're hard together. If you lose your sense of smell, you lose your sense of taste. Okay. So that's the other reason why smell is so important is because it is the only scent that is directly connected to the function of another scent, to another scent. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, couldn't do I that. didn't have it. And I was, that was the trauma. It wasn't like I was like, I'll never be able to like smell my daughter's hair again when I hug her goodnight. That didn't come up. The only but thing that would. came, it would eventually, if it kept going. The only yeah. thing was like, I can't yeah. smell the soap in yeah. my hand. So that was. There's a, a whole, there's a whole book. If you want to dive mm-hmm. into scent and why it's so important, there's a whole a book. There's very few books written about the psychology of, but I've read one about scent itself. And then one about the psychology of scent. I'm in the middle of reading right now, looking right at it. It's called the scent of desire. And it's really important. It talks about how we can lose just about any other scent sense. And it takes us like six months to adjust. And we might suffer severe depression at first, but we do figure out how to adjust. But the sense of smell at first, we don't miss it. And then about after about six months, it becomes, we hit depression and it can cause without intervention from medical professionals can cause people a, an immense amount of depression to the point of it wanting them to unalive themselves. Right. It is way more critical than we recognize it to be. And it is the way that we connect to one another. So sex and physical attraction happens because we actually scent receptors, smell the other person's pheromones and their chemical reaction. So if we don't have a sense of smell, we don't have a desire for sex and we aren't experiencing sex and that, that chemical interaction with other people anymore. That's a massive part of the way that we connect with one another as human beings. So once you start to dive into the sense of smell, you recognize just how vital it is to our everyday life and how little we think about it until it's gone. And so I love that you brought up that like, when I start talking about this with people, they start to recognize, holy shit, I didn't, can I say bad words? (laughs) Yes. Yes, you can. (laughs) Holy shit. I didn't recognize how important it was start talking about it and then they say things like you just did i'll go and wash my hands and my face and bring in this beautiful smell then they start to recognize it and we start to realize how much scent is really a part of our everyday life but we do not actively think about it but if we did we could actually change so much about our daily interaction with our life wow 
Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking of, it's all coming to me now, like thinking about walking yeah. through the woods and how I just love yeah. the smell of the mud and the, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the trees and everything. It's amazing. Was there a point, you were talking about the trauma in your past life, this life, but yeah, was there a point that you discovered how to deal with it? Was there a like a mentor or a book or a yes. single? No. Okay. I came to the realization probably somewhere around the age of 12 or 13. I became, I started dealing with suicidal ideation and just recognizing that I was tired of life sucking. And I read the, I read the book tribal leadership, and this is actually when it became clear to me, like so much happens in language and we recognize how much we've changed in our lives when we see our language change. For me, growing up, my dad's favorite saying was life sucks and then you deal with it. Now, the really key and important part that I learned from reading tribal leadership is that the the idea that life sucks implies that everyone's life sucks and there's no way out of it. That shittiness is pervasive, which isn't true doesn't need to be patriarchy and white supremacy created that way, but it doesn't have to be that way. When we get clear that it's actually my life that sucks, when we can make the delineation between life sucks and my life sucks, it is a massive change in language and change of perspective. Because then we get to recognize that actually change is possible because other people's lives don't suck, which means mine doesn't have to, which means that there are things that I can do or some change that could happen that could alter my reality entirely. And then I started reading a hell of a lot. Obviously I read three or four books typically at a time and typically about three to four books a month. And I started to recognize and started to put sayings from some of these authors that I loved on index cards and tape them all over my wall. And then I would rip pages out of magazines and I started creating the wall of my bedroom as a massive vision board as a way of recalibrating myself and creating mentors in my head and envisioning a different life. And it helped to center me to recognize, no, I don't have anybody in my immediate life whose life I want, but there are people in the world who have different lives than I do. And I do want more than the life I have here. And I don't know that anybody's life has is perfectly blissful. but their lives are better than mine. They're not being beaten or abused or intimidated by their parents every single day of their life. And that was really key for me. Yes, my life didn't change. It stayed really shitty for a really long time. I didn't move out of my parents' house till I was 24 because that's when my father finally moved out and I no longer felt the need to protect my siblings and my mom from him. But until that day, that vision board was became this, They it was the mentors in my head. The books I read, they were the mentors. And each one led me further into curiosity. And curiosity is what saved my life, knowing that some other reality existed and that some other reality could exist. And I could be a part of creating, helping to create a different reality, not just for myself, but for other people. Um, And that is ultimately what led me to become an interior designer and then to become a life designer is that that is what shifted my own reality. And I knew that it could do that for other people. And it has, and it does. Awesome. So a very long answer to your question. (laughs) So Sheena, if you had the entire world on the phone for 43 seconds, what would you tell them? Curiosity could save all of our lives. It would help us to deepen into connection with ourselves, with one another, and lead us to joy in a way that perhaps we're afraid of at this moment, but it will change all of our lives none of us knows what the hell we're doing here. And if we can just get curious, we could change the world. Excellent words, excellent advice. So if, uh, if, how do you, if people want to get a hold of you, how would you like them to get a hold of you and in what capacity? Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of ways to get connected with me, but the easiest way that you can find a plethora of information about me, things that I've written, talks that I've given is on my website and that's consonate.world. And it houses both my interior design practice and that, and that company. And then also life design. There's a whole page on me alone as a speaker and a writer, et cetera. So consonate is C-O-N-C-I-N-N-A-T-E dot world. And it has everything on there. It is this seamless dovetailing of everything that I do and all that I am. 
That will be in the description. Thank you so much for being a guest today. This has been a great talk, a great conversation. And yeah, I've actually learned quite a few things that I'm going to start paying a lot more attention to. I hope that my listeners are going to do the same. Yeah. So I'm going to appreciate your time. Thank you for listening to the Second Mix Podcast. I am Matt Bennett. Please leave a review and give me an honest rating wherever you can. Subscribe on your favorite platform to hear the latest episodes. You can send an email to matt at secondmix.net or go to secondmix.net to read the blog, check out the resources, buy me a cup of coffee, and you can even leave me a voicemail right there on the site. Take steps that will make your week incredible and keep reflecting, revising, and remixing your life. I'll see you soon.